is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, hello, everybody. Well, welcome to another edition of our AMS uh, webinar, a monthly series uh, that we run every month for all our AMS customers. And today's topic of our webinar is common two and a half access uh, support issues. Uh, so we've compiled a list of uh, things that most of our customers were either new or continuing customers who have uh, questions on some of these um, two and a half access topics. Uh, we have compiled those and uh, we're going to be talking about that today. My name is Joe Anand. I'm the uh, product manager here at Microsoft. And today I'll be joining, uh, joined by uh, Don LaCourse. And then we also have a new employee, Pankaj, who's our application engineer, who uh, will be uh, joining us as well. He'll be uh, silently listening to all these questions and he's in training mode right now. So hopefully at some point in time, he'll be uh, taking over some of uh, answering the questions at some point. Uh, so before we get started, uh, some housekeeping tips. Um, Don, next. Oh, oh looks, like have, tips. looks like I don't have. Looks like I'm Okay. All right. So, uh, I mean, for those of you who attend our webinars, you know uh, we want to keep it interactive as interactive as possible. So, go ahead and um, submit your questions in the chat window uh, on the on the window that shows questions, and uh, we'll be monitoring both of us. Uh, Pankaj and I will be monitoring it in the background, and we'll be answering it. And if we need to stop Don while he's doing the demo, uh, we'll definitely be able to do that as well. So. If it, uh, I mean, we don't want to stop the flow of the webinar, but if there's something relevant to what we are discussing, we'll definitely make an attempt to stop and explain things to you. Uh, today's uh, agenda, as I mentioned before, is the common uh, two and a half access support issues. And that uh, on the uh, topics we're going to be going, uh, explaining in more detail. Uh, we're going to start with some of the simpler ones and then uh, go down to some of the more complex things. So we're going to pro progress today. Starting with the use of 2D and 3D geometry, Don's going to explain the differences between 2 and 2D and 3D geometry in the use of 2NF access uh, machining. Uh, also aligning stock to part, uh, establishing work zeros, uh, location of cut geometry. This is in relation to both the tool geometry as well as uh, the actual uh, drive geometry that you're using for cutting. And then cut depth controls, how do you actually control the depth of cuts? Uh, we have a lot of questions about that. It's a little bit, uh, the dialogue is a little bit complex, so we do get questions on that. Uh, cut start site and profiling, a very often a requested uh, question. Uh, then talk about tool geometry and offsets and how we actually process offsets based on the tool geometry inside our product. Use of preferences, CAM preferences, and uh, again, we have a lot of preferences in our system, and these can be very powerful, and but also at the same time uh, can raise a lot, a lot of questions. So we're going to be talking about preferences that are more relevant to the two and a half axis uh, machining methods, and then finally, we're talking about posting issues and the machining issues. Um, you know what the uh, what you what most of our users encounter on the shop floor. And this is also a large area. Uh, this is quite a large area, but we're going to be touching upon the major ones. And then finally, Don's going to uh, talk about online support and how to how to access online support and how do you actually uh, contact us and what are the relevant information we are looking when you are actually contacting us. So, so Don, without further delay, go ahead. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I uh, hope everyone is having a good day. Uh, these first few slides are going to be just uh, basic uh, for all new users or uh, users who haven't had been on the product for very long or haven't done much to access uh, machining. Uh, so it'll get more, more complex as we get through the slides. Um, basically, we're going to talk about, you know, what kind of geometry you can machine and two and a half access machining. Uh, basically, you can machine any type of geometry in two and a half axis. Um, if you have a 2D drawing, such as a DXF file or, or something you've drawn inside of Rhino or inside of Visual CAD, uh, you can uh, machine that in two and a half axis and control your, your cut depths and everything uh, manually using the dialogues. Um, you can also uh, machine prismatic parts. Prismatic meaning uh, basic 
uh, parts who have side vertical side walls, no contoured areas, um, basic uh, uh, two dimensional parts. As you see here on this particular uh, image, we got some slots and pockets and, and whatnot. So that's another set. Um, that's probably the primarily the, the the primary part type that you will machine in two and a half axis, uh, where you already have like a, a flat part that's got some holes and pockets. You know, nothing real real complicated. Now, if we move over to the right, uh, you can also use two and a half axis, or you will end up using two and a half axis operations on more complex parts. And to do that, as very simple, you just select your geometry like you like you do uh, any other geometry. In this particular picture, you see that our control geometry is not flat; it's not 2D. You don't have to select uh, control geometry that's on a flat plane. You can select any area, perimeter area, and the program will flatten it out for you uh, in the background. Uh, it'll do it automatically. So. Um, you can. Oh, one thing. Go ahead. One thing. One thing, Don. I should mention: if you select 3D geometry like that, uh, we will flatten it out, but also move it to the highest point uh, oh, okay. of that uh, mm -hmm. of that curve. So that's where the cutting geometry will start, mm -hmm. unless you t tell otherwise. <clears throat> right. Exactly. Okay. So that's basically the types of geometry that uh, you will encounter in two and a half uh, axis uh, machining. Now we're going to talk uh, for new users. This can be a little bit complicated. Uh, we're going to talk about how do you line your stock model versus your part model. Uh, so internally, there's two different models that's that's managed uh, in the program. When you define your stock, um, that is actually a stock model in the background that it's using and displaying and moving around based on uh, where you want it to align. Uh, in relation to your part. So we're going to go over the different options that you see on this dialogue uh, for basic uh, alignment of stock geometry. And again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat uh, questions panel and we'll be monitoring them. Um, another basic step that can end up uh, causing some support issues is a very critical uh, step called work zeros. Uh, if you you can create a work zero, uh, just make sure that it uh, matches where you're zeroing your machine out on. So a lot of times users will create a work zero in the program, but then they'll fail to uh, zero the machine on that exact same point uh, on uh, the machine or on the stock. And obviously that will cause uh, cut depth position con problems. Uh, your cut depths will be off. Maybe your 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 where you start cutting will be off. Um, and you, you know, obviously, you want to figure want to know what what's going on. So this is one thing to go back and double check. If you're using work zeros, um, make sure that you understand where the work zero is on your part uh, in uh, the program, and then also make sure that it's the same point that you're actually physically, uh, uh, you know, zeroing the machine out at. So this is a, a critical issue. We're gonna talk about this dialogue uh, in detail. Again, um, the same part here that we had on the geometry slide, we're gonna talk about uh, location of cut geometry, this portion of the dialogue up here. Uh, we're gonna talk about all three options, the at top, the at bottom, and the pick top. And um, this can be, it's, it's not that complicated, uh, certainly not as complicated as the cut depth controls, but we're going to go over that so that you can understand, especially how the pick top works, because that can be very helpful uh, for certain types uh, of geometry. Now, here's a more detailed slide on the cut depth controls. If you look at the dialogue over here, we're, look, we're talking about everything from cut depth control down uh, in the dialogue right here that you see. Um, you can use this dialogue to precisely control your roughing cut depths and also your finishing cut depths. Uh, and that's got a number of, uh, you know, parameter fields and sliders. We're gonna go over this uh, basically in detail, but if you look at these four pictures on the left, um, if you look at the orange line, that is where the geometry that you selected 
uh, for your control geometry in this dialog. So if the geometry that you selected is at the top of your cut, you would pick at top. Uh, if it's at the bottom, for instance, if you just have a 2D drawing and it's located at the, you know, on the XY plane at Z0, so it's at the bottom of your cut, so you would pick at bottom. Uh, if you, uh, for any reason, you don't want to the top of the cut to be at the top or the bottom of the geometry that you have selected, you can use the pick top to tell it where to start and then use your cut depths to tell it how deep to cut. So this is very helpful in certain uh, situations. For example, if you just look at this picture here, there's no part geometry, but we have a stock model defined. So in this particular picture, you know, the user wants to cut below uh, the bed of the machine slightly, okay, to make sure they go all the way through. They're going to cut a little bit into their their uh, spoil board, buffer board. Uh, so you can use the pick top, tell it where to start, the cut depth, how depth to go, and you, that can pass the bottom of your control geometry if you need it to be. And then this other picture just uh, goes over the dialogue, how you can break up the rough uh, and the finished depths. Again, this is one of the one of the more complex concepts for new users to grasp, uh, but once you understand how it's broken up and how the dial one how the parameters work, it's pretty straightforward. So, to follow on the cut depth controls, uh, we're going to look at this particular part here and how you can use the cut depth controls for different depths. So in this particular part, we have this is a little bit more complex, but the program takes care of it for you. We have two pocket areas, but they're not at the same depth. So our control geometry, we just pick the bottom of each pocket and define uh, the cut depth controls, and it figures that out for you based on the different depths of the pocket. So that's one thing that you may not know uh, that the program can do. Uh, so you can take advantage of that, and we'll be looking at that. Uh, in detail. Now, uh, in profiling, um, this is a concept, a basic concept in two and a half axis uh, machining. You have a a start point where you, the cutter is going to start cutting. Now, this is the where the the cutting feed rate begins. This is the start of the cut, not the entry motion, but where the cutting starts. And for profiling. Many times you will not profile a closed circle or a closed square. You may just have a line, okay? So you need to understand where the cut's going to start, which side of the line the cut's going to uh, be on. And if you look at this top left dialog uh, picture over here, uh, if you're standing at the start point of the curve, if you look at the line here, it's got a little square box. That shows you in the program where the start point is of that geometry. So if you picture yourself standing on that start point and you're looking in the direction of the curve, uh, just use your right and left, and that will determine which side of the cut is going to be on. If you select right side, it's going to be on this side. Left, obviously, be on the opposite side. Uh, it's all determined based on uh, where the start point is. So if you have a closed curve, it's the same concept. Uh, every curve has a start point. For instance, a circle has a start point in the program. And if you're going on the right side, you're going to be going, if you're facing uh, the direction of uh, the curve, the right will be on the outer side. In closed curves, you can select uh, inside, outside as well. Um, and just another, uh, if you're just using a uh, elliptical curve or any type of curve, again, uh, start point right and left. Now. If you look at this bottom picture here, uh, if you have multiple curves in your geometry, for instance, in this picture here, uh, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight curves, okay, and they're not merged together. So if you if you just select the eight uh, uh, surface edges or curves you will see that you got all kinds of start points, okay? So it's highly recommended that you join all of your curve geometry into a single curve. That way you know where the start point of is of that 
merged curve. So that makes it a lot more uh, intuitive for you, but it also solves a lot of potential problems. If you look up in this uh, dialog in the top right here, these are some of the problems you can run into if you're not merging your curve geometry. You can have self-intersecting curves. You can have curves that touch other curves or that intersect or, or overlap uh, curves, and that will throw an error in the program. It won't understand you know, how to process those curves if you have a curve on top of a curve or if you have a curve uh, partially on top of a curve or touching another curve. It could just cause a lot of complication. So again, um, clean your curve geometry up by merging it into a single curve. Follow that procedure by merging your curves. Understand that, double check that it is a single curve. You know where the start point is. That way when you machine it, you understand uh, which is the cut side, where is the start point, etc. cetera. Um, and then also on the far right, uh, that can cause problems if your curves don't connect. Uh, your curves, uh, if, you're, if you're doing a continuous cut and you have multiple curves, you more than likely want those curves to touch end to end. So if they're not touching end to end, then you're going to end up with uh, separate start points. You're going to have a gap uh, in your cut. Uh, so just be aware, again, if you go, to, go through the procedure of merging your curve geometry and understanding that they are merged, it is one curve, you know where the start point is, all of these issues that you see in this dialogue will go away. So you resolve those up front before you start uh, the programming uh, process and have to run into errors and whatnot. And again, um, a list of the common geometry issues that we just covered. Uh, pay attention to the curve start point and the cut side. We stressed that a number of times on this slide. Uh, always merge coincident curves into one curve. We mentioned that a, a number of times, very important. Um, your curve boundaries, understand they don't have to be planar. If you have planar curves, that's great to select them. They don't have to be planar. If you have curves that are 3D curves or contoured curves, uh, you can use those as well. Uh, again, uh, these procedures apply. If you have three-dimensional curves, uh, make sure they're joined end-to-end uh, -end, and you have a single curve, uh, whether it's a contoured three-dimensional curve or whether it's just a flat 2D curve. The same principles uh, apply. And then uh, also understand that in 3D models, you don't have to have curves. You can use the edges of your, your surfaces uh, as your curve boundaries. Now, just some basic tool geometry concepts that you need to understand uh, in two and a half axis. If you look on this, dialog on this uh, slide, we have four basic tool types that you're gonna use in two and a half axis, starting from the left, a flat mill, a ball mill, a V-mill, and a chamfer mill. Uh, flat mill, obviously you're gonna use that for cutting flat pockets or facing or clearing up uh, areas. Uh, if you look at the ball mill, you see we've got a red X in there. Typically you want to avoid ball mills for two and a half axis uh, programming unless you absolutely need it. Um, the reason is uh, that ball is gonna ride over your your control geometry. For instance, if you look at that picture right here, we call it the waterfall effect. Uh, as that ball mill travels, you know, starting at the top of your curved geometry, it's going to roll over that edge of the ball. And it's going to, uh, if you, this is an important edge on your part, it's going to degrade that edge uh, significantly. So you want to avoid that uh, if at all possible. Now also the, the V-mill, obviously, if you're cutting chamfers, or if you're uh, doing tapered walls, uh, just understand uh, where the cutting uh, uh, points are on that V bit. In each one of these tools, the yellow area is the flute length, uh, just so you understand where, I would put the red dots in there, so you, uh, these are the critical points on the tools that you need to understand uh, what's gonna be compensated for in the two and a half axis operation. And again, uh, the chamfer mill, obviously the same. Uh, you can cut flat areas with the chamfer, but also chamfer mill, but also you can cut tapered size and, and uh, chamfered uh, edges and such. So just understand the basic tool types and where the cutting uh, portions of that tool uh, are going to be calculated from.
We don't know. What, what I, I want to mention one of the common support issues we get is uh, people usually pick a curve and use a ball mill and um, run a toolpath, and they will see that the toolpath is right on the curve, and uh, they will wonder why there's the, the tool radius is not being applied uh, to the cut. And uh, the reason is this waterfall effect that Don's got a picture for. Uh, we actually um, you know, compute the offsets based on the tool geometry. So if you have a curve and you did not specify any cut depth, so you're basically telling the system that you want to put a toolpath right at that level of that uh, curve. And if you have a ball mill, the offset is actually zero. Because if you put a ball mill right at that cut level, uh, the offset of that uh, ball mill is zero. And so we, we don't offset that curve and you'll see a toolpath right on that curve. And this can be confusing, especially to uh, you know new users. But the main reason is because we fully honor the geometry of the tool, and depending on the uh, geometry, the offsets will be different. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah, just to, just to reiterate, reiterate that there, the tip of the tool is the program point typically. So the tip of the ball mill, the 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 uh, most uh, Z depth tip of the ball mill is going to ride right on that curve. So that's what uh, Joe was mentioning. And here, this is just a, a another view of the tool looking down on the XY plane where the tool is positioned in relation to different types of cuts. Uh, if, again, if you consider the last slide, we mentioned the tip of the tool is the program point. So in facing, the tip of the tool will ride uh, on your perimeter curve. So in this view, on, I'm looking on the far left side, the control geometry is the outer perimeter uh, of the object. So the tip of the tool will start on the uh, extreme perimeter and work its way in. Uh, again, flat mills are used to clear flat areas. Remember, remember that. Uh, also in pocketing, uh, your control geometry, you're picking obviously the outer uh, diameter or the outer perimeter of the pocket. Uh, the tool is compensated for the diameter of the tool. So the uh, the perimeter diameter of the tool is a contact point. And the tip of the tool, uh, again, is offset from your uh, control geometry uh, for each offset as it works its way in. Profiling, very similar to pocketing, but only you only have one pass around the outer perimeter. Again, uh, uh, you want to use a flat end mill for pocketing, and the perimeter uh, of the uh, the tool diameter is compensated for based on your perimeter curve and your your center of your tool is calculated for the tool path. And uh, engraving is a very unique operation used for a lot of different applications that you can't necessarily do with other operation types. In engraving, the tip of the tool will exactly follow the curve that you select. So if you imagine that, imagine having that much control over exactly where that tool is going to go, uh, you can use engraving to do a lot of different things. So in engraving, you're selecting the actual uh, center of the tool, where the center of the tool is going to follow. You're not, you're not, in this particular view, you see we got a slot. We're not picking the outer perimeter. We're not picking the inner perimeter. We're picking the center of the slot. Um, we have slotting operations as well, but this is just an example. Uh, the tool tip will follow uh, that center curve and create a, sl a round slot. So, so you can use that uh, for a lot of different uh, applications. Again, this is just another picture, a three-dimensional view of those uh, different operations, uh, all using a flat mill. Uh, just to reiterate, uh, the outer perimeter and facing uh, is selected, and the tool will go, there will be a path right on the outer perimeter to clear. Obviously, you want to clear that base off, so it's going to go right out to the edge. Pocketing uh, is going to compensate for the tool diameter, and your tool path uh, will be uh, offset inwards. Profiling, uh, the same. Uh, you're selecting your uh, outer perimeter of your profile. The tool geometry diameter is compensated for, and the tool path uh, is offset. And again, here's the engraving example uh, to make the tool follow an exact path that you want it to follow. 
Now let's talk about uh, preferences. Uh, if you're a new user, this is probably the first place you want to go. Uh, if you go uh, uh, into, I'll show you in the program where how to get to it, the preferences dialog. But we have a lot of different tabs on this um, dialog. You're going to want to go over each one of these tabs and look at each one of these preferences. We have tooltips, so turn your tooltips on here. You see this option here, and it'll explain to you what each of these uh, options mean. So it's highly recommended that you do that uh, up front. Uh, very first thing so you get an understanding. You may not know what each of them are, but at least you understand in the back of your mind, okay, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have to do with this thing or that thing. So uh, it'll, it'll strike that in your memory when you get to it and need to make any adjustment to the preferences. But in two axes, um, um, you have, if you look here on the right, we have the, uh, the post processor. Uh, options. These can cause problems. You can use these to resolve issues. Uh, I'm going to go over that uh, later. Uh, and then also the user interface uh, tab can uh, be used to solve some issues too. Um, posting issues. Now this is a rather broad uh, topic. Uh, there's a lot of different things that you may encounter. Uh, but we covered the five basic things that you may run into and you may be scratching your head or you're having a panic attack because something's going on and you, you need to post this and get this cut. Um, the five most common things that you might run into, my post is missing. If you look at the dialog here, you have the select post processor dialog. I'll show you that, how to get to that. Um, where you select your post, current post processor, it's empty. So if I if you run into that, you know, you're going to be worrying, you know, I need a post, you know, so where where did it go and why is it empty? So we're going to talk about that. Um, your posted file extension is wrong. If you need to post a .nc file or .prg file or .tap file and for some reason it's posting a different extension and your controller can't read that, so you got a problem. So you need to know where that's controlled and how to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, when I pick post, nothing happens. So obviously that's a problem. So uh, if you have it set up, if you don't have it set up to automatically post to a different certain folder, et cetera, uh, and you're expecting a, that dialog to pop up to tell you where, you know, to let you define the name of the file and where to post it to, if that's not displaying, uh, then you're going to be in a panic mode. So we're going to talk about that. Um, I can't locate the JUCO file after you post it. Um, you thought you posted it in the right place, but for some reason you can't find it. So we'll talk about those. And a lot of these things uh, are just dialogue specific things that you can check and double check and make sure that uh, everything is set correctly uh, so that none of these things happen. We're going to talk about machining issues. Well, this is the primary slide when we don't have a demo for machining issues, but um, we're going to talk about what some of the things that can happen, the five most common things that uh, you're going to call us about or email us about uh, because starting on the left, I checked the simulation, but the GCO file won't run on my machine. You're getting an error or whatever. My machine displays an error and will not continue the program. What do I do? Um, I can't cut. So the number three, my cut depths are all wrong. Uh, we mentioned uh, in the earlier slide about your work zero. If you're not, if you haven't zeroed machine at the, at the exact location that you've selected in the program in in Rhino Cam or Visual CAD Cam, obviously your cut depths are going to be all wrong, and you're going to be scratching your head and wondering and wasting uh, cut material on the machine uh, because those are, are not coming out right. Uh, another one that's really um, uh, common is we'll get an email to support and say, the surface finish is unacceptable. The program is not cutting right. It's not, you know, what's wrong, okay? So there's a number of things that you want to look at and one of the things you can do, and we actually have a whole blog article, help topic article on accuracy, and, and the program can be as accurate as you need it to be. Uh, 
in the default parameters at the factory set parameters when you load the program it's not tuned in for the most accuracy because there's a there's some overhead involved anytime you increase accuracy you're going to have more computation time so it's the pro factory defaults are set in most common uh, uses for accuracy uh, so you can adjust those if you need more accuracy uh, typically you won't loosen your accuracy and you know unless you've got a really large part and you're really not worried about accuracy you can loosen it to make the, the processing go faster uh, but finish, for surface finish is a key area that we get a lot of support calls on uh, the cutting tool gouged my part so this can happen for a number of different reasons um, if you're trying to cut too deep uh, let's say you got an eighth inch diameter tool and you're trying to cut it a, an inch deep obviously you wouldn't do that but if you try to by accident you're going to that tool is going to deflect or it may break let's say it's not going to break let's say it's going to deflect so obviously you're going to have gouging in your perimeter the curves that you selected this typically will happen if it's going to happen it'll happen at the start point or at the end point at the start of the cut or the end of the cut uh, you may see a little a dimple in the side of your part wonder why that's happening um, you know check your tool diameter your cut depths make sure you're not trying to cut more than you can uh, for that particular tool uh, there's other uh, things that can cause that uh, if you're starting and stopping on the at the same point and you're cutting a soft material uh, depending on the perimeter curve if it's if it's a three-dimensional curve some tolerance can come into play so that you start and then stop at not the exact same point that you started uh, so tolerances can build up again that has to do with accuracy uh, issues that can happen so you may see a little dimple on your your cut start point uh, so those are some things that uh, well, Don I, I got I got a pet peeve that I got to <laughs> talk about okay you know, many actually many times we get uh, customers calling suddenly saying hey my uh, part is coming out all wrong everything was working great until yesterday and something changed suddenly uh, software is not working like uh, yesterday so if this happens uh, please uh, note that the software if it worked yesterday correctly it's not going to change today the problem most probably is with your machine uh, something has changed on the machine maybe your machine has gone out of alignment or maybe the part was not fixtured correctly uh, and so I know the first uh, inclination for customers is to blame the software or the CAM software, but we have gone through many, many times with customers and we have to spend a lot of time showing them that the software indeed is working correctly. So please, uh, when you run into this, especially uh, if this was something that was working before and, and you see that uh, suddenly not working, the errors probably are most probably on the, on the shop floor not on the CAM software side. So I just want to uh, make that point. So yeah, when, especially, when you this. Yeah, especially um, a, a particular instance of that would a user would say, well, I ran this program last week or I ran it yesterday or whatever. And, you know, it's been running fine every time I run this part, but now it's not. So as Joe mentioned, um, if, you, if you ran the same program, same G code, you know, in the same software version, nothing's changed. And obviously it's, you know, it's not going to be in the program. So something's changed outside uh, of the program itself that, you know, obviously the, the program doesn't have control over and that's the machine. The setup uh, is a big area, as you mentioned, that the problems can arise because there's manual work uh, in the setup. So double check uh, all of that. Good point. Okay. Oh, let's also we got another column here in the center that we didn't talk about. When contacting uh, support, this is very important for both us and you to make sure that you get answers as fast as you can. Because when you're calling us, you don't have time to waste. Okay, we don't want to waste your time, and you don't want to waste our time, which in turn wastes your time. So look at these six items. And we're going to go over them in detail. Be as specific as possible. When you email us, believe it or not, we have users that will email us 
and we'll say this program doesn't work and they'll send us the G code file, but nothing else. It doesn't work. Now, obviously there's nothing we can do with that. You know, what, you know, what do we, we may look back plot the G code program, but we're probably not going to do anything. We're going to just respond to you in the email. We're going to ask for more information. So when you email us the very first time, be as specific as you can. If it takes a paragraph or two, take a paragraph or two. Okay. Uh, obviously you don't want to write a book because it's going to take us 30 minutes to read it, but you know, just be as specific to get all the pertinent information as you can that you understand that you know, uh, so that we can uh, better help you. Uh, attach your post definition file. A lot of times, users will say, you know, it posted, like Joe mentioned, it posted yesterday, or now it's not posting, or I'm getting an error on the machine when I posted this file. Um, yes, we can look at your G code file, but we can't we can't recommend any changes because we don't have your post uh, po post processor definition file. And that's a file. I'll show you uh, what that file is and, and, and where it's at. Uh, but we yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the post definition file is uh, needed only if there's a posting issue. Yeah. If you see a, a problem in the uh, part itself, yeah, you wouldn't need it. Uh, this is only when you, when you think there is an issue with the post. Okay. You want the posting file. Mm -hmm. uh, Pictures are worth a thousand words, obviously. If show us a picture of what's happening, show us a picture of your, your controller screen. If you've got an error message, obviously we have to have a picture of that screen that has the exact description of the error, the line number of the error. Give us the G code file that you ran for that particular error to occur, not a different one. Don't post it again. We need the exact same program you ran with the exact same line number so we can look at it and 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 determine exactly what might be causing the problem. Uh, so pictures are absolutely required and in other cases they're very, very helpful to determine, you know, you know, what's causing a problem. Either a picture of the screen in the program, you can do a screen grab or just a picture uh, of a part that's sitting on your table uh, that's incorrect and you're, you don't understand what happened. Um, if it's G code file related, um, make sure, as I mentioned, make sure you send the exact G code file that you ran that caused the error on your machine. Um, again, images uh, if possible. So if you follow those six things, the very first time that you contact us, in, in all likelihood and in, in all cases, it will shorten the time that you get answers back. Uh, we know that for sure because that's the way it the way it happens running through uh, doing support for years and years users when they have a problem they tend to just react and send us an email but you need to take some time for you to understand what's happening on your end to understand what you don't understand so that you can help us understand uh, what's not or what's not working right so it'll uh, make the process go uh, a lot faster. So when you go back and watch this video of the of the webinar, check stop on this screen, the screen, uh, all of the screens, but more these last few slides, and make sure you read them and and make notes of them. Print it out, and, you know, pin it on your wall right beside your computer if you don't remember or if you got so much going on. If you have an error, this is what I got to do: one, two, three, four. Okay, so that'll help you out. Yeah, I just want to add this note uh, saying, you know, I mean, we're not trying to make your job harder. Uh, it's just uh, we're just trying to help you. When you come to support, we're trying to doing our best to help you. And this, all of this is tailored to do our job better so we can help you, you know, in a better ma manner. So that's why we are asking this. Don't consider this as a so some kind of onerous thing that we're putting on you. So. Yeah, yeah. Like I said in, in the beginning of the of this slide, help us help you in, in the fastest way possible. Okay. Uh, again, we mentioned the online support. A lot of the topics that we're covering here, uh, we are listed in our what we call our web help. Uh, so this is uh, if you go to your web browser uh, in the link in the description link in this video, I will put the links to the different to the RhinoCam 2023 and the VisualCAD Give 2023 web help. So you can go to these uh, 
web help systems and we have uh, uh, sections in here for questions or you see FAQs here um, a lot of these topics that we're covering are discussed here uh, what you do uh, in this case so this is going to be a very helpful resource uh, and then uh, also, the online help over here in the top left, uh, you can look at your resource guide. We'll show you how to get to that, uh, which has a lot of uh, tutorials and things that will help you out.